fairly on time, no pressure, Ted, um, because there's a there's going to be a minute of silence at exactly two forty six, I think. Um, so we're going to be aiming to be done by two forty five. So I guess maybe we should think about getting started. Yeah, you. Yeah, we could <laughs> we just. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, th I suspect we'll be mid-conversation and then the speaker will do a big doo-doo. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to our, our, the first of two excellent speakers today. So again, this is part of our uh, TSVP thematic session on response, diversity, and stability. Um, and so I want to welcome uh, Tad Dallas to the stage. Tad is a, an assistant professor at the Department of, I'm going to get this wrong, Biological Sciences at the, the University of uh, South Carolina, um, before then was at um, Louisiana State University. Um, and yeah, I, I first came across Tad's work. You, you've got a nice, as it an ecology paper, letters paper on abundance distributions that I thought was really cool uh, a few years ago. And then since then kind of explored your back catalog a bit more and then discovered some mutual interests in variability and things like this. So I'm, uh, yeah, delighted to hand over to Tad to tell us about temporal variability in populations and communities. Go ahead. Yeah. Is this sim working? Can people hear me okay? No, sir. Right. Nice. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I've had an amazing time so far and I look forward to interacting and collaborating with uh, folks um, here in the department as well as in the visiting scholars program. Uh, I think I'll be able to hit the timing just perfectly because I actually only have like 30, 35 slides and some of which are just like a sentence of text. Um, as much as Sam tries to like pump me up, my background research, the amount of research I've done on temporal variability and population dynamics is actually fairly small. And so really I'll be talking about two papers that I think are like most germane to this group. Um, some of my other research focuses on macroecology, so large scale patterns of species abundance and distribution as well as the study of ecological networks. Um, before I go on, I gotta do the classic, I acknowledge the lab, they are the ones who do most of the work. Um, and so this dates back from LSU, uh, but many of them are still actively pursuing research in my lab. We have undergrads and research technicians on the far left, graduate students, which are all current um, with me in South Carolina in the middle there, and then two postdocs, Robbie has gone on to great things, um, and Damie Pak is joining the lab this June. So really excited about doing some cool disease modeling work with her. Uh, for more information, check out lab webpage and see publications, software, et cetera. I'm also happy to talk about it while here. Um, you wanna grab coffee or anything? All right. So I'll start with like a thing that we sort of already know and then I'll build up from there. So the thing we like all know and all like sort of, or not all work on, but many of us work on, um, is population variability. Populations fluctuate through time. They fluctuate for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, this could be environmental variability. And so populations track their environments and their dynamics change as a function of different environments. It could be simply non-equilibrial population dynamics. So even simple models can lead to fluctuations in which you don't need um, environmental variability to actually force that. Uh, there could be, and there's the et cetera, just encapsulates everything that you're like probably thinking that I didn't write down. But there's also the rule of natural enemies. And so when you think about predators, parasites, interest of com competition, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many things that cause populations to fluctuate. They fluctuate both, or like we can examine population fluctuation and temporal variability in population dynamics at species level or at population level. And so at species level, we can see huge differences in um, life history that cause uh, differences in growth forms. So obviously on the right, we have arbor seals, right? fur seals, um, and it, the times in terms of years. And then we have Daphne on the left, the times in terms of days. It's about differences in generation time and population growth rates that lead to different dynamics. And here density or, or abundance is on the y-axis. And you can see the Daphne are very bursty. They overshoot and then settle back down to a carrying capacity. Meanwhile, the fur seals seem to like more gently approach that sort of um, upper limit. We can also think about population differences or population variability um, within a single species. I show this, this is actually one of my favorite figures to teach from because this is uh, Daphnia populations that are clonal. So there's no genetic 
diversity there. Um, they're kept in an incubator. So the environment is completely constant. And yet you see the shaded region being uh, one standard deviation away from the mean for a set of populations that are started at different initial densities. And so we have 20 individuals per liter, 40, 80, and 160. And so you see, uh, even in the absence of environmental variation or genetic, differenti genetic differences, you see a lot of variability in population trajectories. All right. Uh, I care because that's fun, right? I care because like, I wanna know what drives that. I wanna be able to put bounds around that, that's cool. Other people care because population variability is related to things that we care about. And so population variability is related to extinction risk. Um, as this paper from Melbourne and Hastings in 2008 starts to get at, thinking about um, temporal variability uh, in the environment and in demographics rate, in, in demographic rates through the lens of, of stochasticity. Uh, I'll focus mostly on the two top questions here for the sake of this talk. I will dive in a little bit into, is everything just neutral? Because it's fun, right? It's like, it, it's a nice, like, maybe it's that. When it's never that, but it is like, maybe it is. Uh, and so the first question is, is population variability conserved for a species? And then we'll go into some fun uh, global biotime data and look at, um, the environment as a dominant driver of population variability. Yeah. All right, so the first question, we're gonna start out thinking about beetles. And so this is, I'm, I'm gonna calculate population variability for a bunch of beetles, um, species distributed across the US. And I'm gonna try to ascribe that variation in temporal variability in population dynamics to where they are, geographic location, the environmental variability, and then species identity. So is it life history differences that are driving population variability? Is it geographic location or is it environmental variability? With geographic location, picking up a bunch of like unmeasured environmental variation or community effects of competition or resource variability, something like that. To do this, I'm using the data from the uh, National Ecological Observatory Network in the US called NEON. Um, it's 47 sites that are sampled that are terrestrial and they're sampled for these carabid beetles, ground beetles, of which there's, I think, 762 species that are recorded in these data. Um, and here we have species richness as point size and estimated mean population variability, which I'll talk about how we estimate that in a second, um, according to that color chart. Uh, I think the next slide just goes over more of the same. Yeah. Um, this is a good reminder though, they're sampled every two weeks. So I use these data, even though NEON actually have a bunch of other data that are really useful on um, small mammals, plants, mosquitoes, ticks, uh, other stuff, um, but they don't sample them every two weeks until uh, it's too cold. And so every two weeks from 2013 to 2021 is a pretty well-resolved time series that we can actually work with and, and get at temporal variability and population dynamics. Uh, and I'm gonna do so in a bunch of different ways. And so we've already seen this map. So focus on sort of the right panel. What we have to work from in terms of like the fodder are time series. And so it's time is the X axis of panel B um, in which we have abundance. So these are fluctuating beetle abundances as a function of time. Every two weeks they're sampled. And what we wanna do is be, we wanna be able to partition the variation in population variability down between species life history differences or species differences geographic location, and then I can't, I'm not that tall to reach the top one, but environmental variability. But we also wanna look further than that. And so in order to do that, I'm going to take uh, average population variability per species and see if there's a phylogenetic signal in it. And I'm also gonna take average population variability at a given site and see if there's a geographic or spatial signal in it. All right, so overall goal, partition the effects of environmental, or sorry, partition the effects um, of temporal variability in, in population dynamics as a function of species identity, geographic location, and uh, environmental variability, with the secondary goal of trying to see those larger scale averaged out patterns of phylogenetic signal or spatial signal in population temporal variability. All right. And to do that, we started to think about how differences in these parameters or different in, in sort of species, environmental variability and location would translate to how you would think about it in uh, modeling, population um, dynamics. 
And so if you think about species differences, that's life history differences, we can think about that more as like a mean shift across uh, different um, population growth rate or mortality rate or something like that. Um, meanwhile, we can think about environmental variability more as temporal variability in the environmental conditions. And so it's about the temporal structure of those demographic parameters. And then finally, location, we're just throwing all like, that's, that's our what else bin. And so it's any unmeasured environmental or maybe un unmeasured environmental variation or community level effects. And so that's all the um, interspecific interactions that I uh, will ignore. Uh, and you'll see, maybe you won't see why I ignore them, but you'll see how I ignore them in the next slide, I think. Uh, why I ignore them is because um, parameterizing this model, that alpha matrix, it's like you're either just pulling from a random distribution or it, it's really hard to actually estimate it. Um, and so let's go back one slide actually to think about how we're going to estimate temporal variability in population dynamics. A common used uh, statistic would be the coefficient of variation. And that's just standard deviation or temporal variance of the vector of population abundances divided by the mean. This does not account for the temporal structure of the data. And I think that's like a big shortcoming. And so I was really excited when I found this uh, consecutive disparity index, which starts to get at the structure of abundance as a function of time, um, as a measure of essentially stability. They don't call it that. I tried to avoid calling it that because stability is such a loaded term. Um, but I'll probably slip up and say it a few times in this talk. All right. For the more of like theoretical part of this, because this was published in theoretical ecology, so it needed to have theory. Um, just fair. Uh, we're using a, a discrete time Ricker model. And so this models the population size at time t plus one as a function of population size at the time it is now, multiplied by some population growth rate r. And then um, if I just blocked out the last portion of that, I would have a like exponentially growing population. So I need something to punch it back down. And the thing that's punching it back down is intraspecific population limitation, that alpha and T term. All right. On top of this model, we incorporated demographic stochasticity by considering birth as uh, random draws from a Poisson distribution. So that's a count distribution as a like, uh, mean equal to the variance. Um, and then we also treated death as a binomial process. And so every time step, flip a coin, with some value P or some probability P, you die. All right. And we can start to explore and we can use this model to generate hypotheses about how temporal variability might look in our data. And so we can see um, if we increase population growth rate on the X axis, we see that leads to more population stability. Temporal variability and population dynamics goes down when population growth rate is high. I'm sure if you pushed it beyond the point that I pushed it, we might start to get into areas where it does some weird stuff, hence that constrained parameter range. And that was one prediction. Another prediction is thinking about um, how we incorporate environmental stochasticity into the model. And so here we have environmental stochasticity. And so this is temporal variation in the structure of noise that's applied to our population growth rate term R and then our competition term alpha. And so basically larger values means more variation as a function of time in that parameter. And so we see, and we have, so we have coefficient of variation on this side just for completeness for those coefficient of variation lovers. And on the other side, D, we have the statistic D, that consecutive disparity index. And you see basically as you increase either the variance in uh, your interspecific competition term on the y-axis or in terms of your population growth rate on the x-axis, you see populations tend to have more temporal variability. More variable environments result in more variable population dynamics. It's something that we can show in theory, something that we're actually decently bad at showing in empirical data. There's actually not that much evidence for this thing that we're showing here. Um, each one of these cells is based on 100 simulations averaged out, and it still bothers me that it's not like as clear. And so you see these little blips of bright blue. So maybe if we did it for more, maybe it would be more continuous surface, but here we are. But we still have sort of expectations for how we expect um, average population growth rate shifts and variability in these demographic rates to influence temporal variability in population dynamics. All right, enough theory. Let's go back to the beetles. Let's see what they have to tell us. Let's try to partition some of this variance out. And so how we did this is we fit models a total of, so we had three variables. So we have seven potential candidate models. 
um, with all combinations of those variables, including the full model. And we can take an R squared as a measure of like, that's the amount of variance I explained, where higher means better, bounded at one. And we don't get anywhere near one. We're gonna get to about 0.15 here, at least for the single variable models. And so to orient you, these are the R squared values for single variable models around the outside. And then where the uh, diagram is overlapping, you have those joint models. And so the maximum amount of variance we can explain in the data is around 0.25 for the full model. Um, but hopefully your eyes are just drawn to that bottom left. So species identity as a single variable model explained like a chunk, a decent chunk of the variation in temporal variability and population dynamics. Um, meanwhile, environmental variability, which is the one I was rooting for, explained actually quite little. And the sub variable therein so I calculated temporal variability in temperature and temporal variability in precipitation. And this is done using the PRISM data. And so it's monthly data uh, on mean precipitation and temperature. And then I calculated it for the entire time that the beetle, that site was sampled. Um, and I was like, oh, it's gonna have the biggest impact. And it didn't. And so species identity is most important. However, I was a little bit heartened by to see that the joint, the combined um, forces, the combined effect of species identity and environmental variability um, still was one of the highest performing models, especially of the two variable models. And so it says that there's a role for both of these things. There's a role for species identity and there's a role for environmental variability on temporal structure of population dynamics. All right, and then we can mash it all together. Um, and so we were looking for a spatial signal and a phylogenetic signal. Spatial signal, when we took the mean population variability for a given site, and then phylogenetic signal, when we took the mean population variability for a species. We don't see a spatial signal. You're not even gonna see a spatial signal plot. All you'll see is this lovely phylogeny. It's still, I look back and I'm like, should I have tried to incorporate species identity into these models in another way than fitting like many hundreds of coefficients, because that's what I had to do. Because, so I'm like preempting a question here, because there's just so many like polytomies and this like phylogeny is just not the best. And so if anybody can help me with that, I plan to work on with these, uh, the Carabid beetle data in the future. So happy to chat about phylogenies. Um, so overall findings from this, species identity is important, environmental variability is important, there is a phylogenetic signal in mean population variability, no spatial signal. All right, and I think I'm right on track, I'm doing great. So let's hop on to the next question. Next question, we're gonna go from, instead of uh, just US, we're gonna go global with the data. Um, we're still gonna use the same population dynamic models or ICR models just for funsies and continuity, why not? Um, and this is thinking about how population variability can scale to community level variability. And this is something Sam alluded to in his talk um, earlier, a couple days ago. And he, uh, I think he mainly talked about the insurance effects. This is called the portfolio effects. Um, the general idea is that the composite, excuse me, the composite variation in the abundance of all individuals in the community, which is that white line varying across time on the X, is going to be less than that of the average population variability. And so each color down here represents a fluctuating population. We take the mean very like the mean consecutive disparity index D, and it is greater than that of the entire community. And this is because uh, populations fluctuate um, via like compensatory dynamics. They fluctuate in response um, to the environment in slightly independent ways, and these fluctuations can sort of cancel each other out, leading to what looks to be a very stable community. I mean, that's not as stable as it could be, especially when you think of like zero sum models and things like that. Um, all right, so that's the general idea of the portfolio effect. And now let's dive into how we're actually gonna test it. And so for this, I use the biotime data. And so the biotime data are a collection of, I think like over 700, that might be wrong. Um, data from over 700 studies. Right? I'm gonna just assert that. Um, with the median one sampled for six years. Um, this is a labor of, of a lot of work and hopefully some love um, from some great folks uh, at St. Andrews. And I think at least one of them is going to be visiting here as part of this, uh, Laura Antow, who has a postdoc with in Helsinki as well. 
Um, and so from these data, each point represents a study. Um, and then we see population dynamics uh, up the top left and the top right panels and the corresponding community dynamics across time. And those are just taken from sort of representative locations where point size indicates species richness at a given site. And then color indicates the number of sample plots at that location. Um, for the sake of this study, I averaged abundance from plot level to site level, um, just to get around some of the small scale variation in um, abundance estimates at plot level. Um, but in the supplement of this paper, I go into detail on how that doesn't really matter. All right, so we're gonna do the same record model. Um, maybe even sillier in the assumptions that I make here, because once again, I do not want to estimate that alpha. And I also feel bad about pulling it from just random numbers because it's, it, it's nonsense. Um, people still do it. It was popularized, I guess, way back when May did it. And then it just like kept on keeping on. Um, it weirds me out a little bit. And so instead I did something potentially weirder. And so I said, there are no interspecific interactions. <laughs> I assembled completely neutral communities uh, by sampling a bunch of different R and alpha values across a range and then just assembling, just like mixing them up onto a bag and pulling them out randomly, assembling a community as a function of species that weren't interacting at all. And so that's a completely neutral community assumption. Is that neutral? That's neutral. I don't even know. It might be like past neutral. And so what we want to do here is we want to take our index D, that is our temporal variability index, and we want to relate the population level. So this is average species in the population or population level D to our community level. So one considering just time series of individual species and on the Y axis considering the abundance of the entire community. And so we see that in our simulated data, everything looks beautiful, right? That is a clear portfolio effect. The temporal variability in our community abundance is much less than what we see in our mean population sense, our mean population um, time series. And then we like mash on the real data and things get a little uglier. And so neutral simulated communities show clear portfolio effects. And they show them, I guess I should go back a second. They show them, um, especially for really species rich communities, which makes sense. If you add in more species and you take more poles, you're more likely to get sort of compensatory dynamics and further just push that community uh, temporal variability down towards zero. And when we don't see this is when we use real data. And so what we see here is no real evidence for, por for portfolio effects in the biotime data. And so if things were on that one-to-one -one line, it would just be like, eh, we didn't really see it. And with ideally a lot of the points being in this region, we broke it up into uh, marine, freshwater, and terrestrial systems. Um, and then point color corresponds to species richness. And so um, it didn't play out in the empirical data as we thought it would um, given our simulations. It's like, so the influence of species richness, we don't really see those high species richness being forced down into that region. Um, and we sort of see points all over the place. All right, real communities don't seem to show clear portfolio effects. Real communities don't show portfolio effects, but what they do show is a latitudinal increase. So with increasing latitude, you have increasing average population variability and increasing community variability. Two potential drivers of this. One is species richness. Um, as you have, I guess it was, decreasing species richness with increasing latitude. Um, the other is with increasing absolute latitude, you have higher environmental variability. And so near the tropics, you tend to have quite stable environments. Meanwhile, environmental variability, as we saw on that heat map before, can have like real implications for temporal variability and population and community dynamics. I don't know which one it is. It could be one of those. Um, we also see differences in average community and population variability across systems um, with freshwater systems having the highest population and one of the lowest um, community level variability. All right. That's the finding. Population community variability increased with latitude. I thought that was a neat finding. All right. And we're doing great on time. I'm like under time. I got in my head about it. I'm sorry. 
So hopefully I haven't like gone through this too quickly. Um, I still got a little bit of time to talk about future directions though. So overall findings of what I know about environmental or population variability, which isn't that much, um, is that populations and communities vary through time. I know that's true. I've seen it in empirical data and in my simulation. Um, and I've seen that population community variability are uh, related to species identity, like we saw in the beetles. They're related to environmental variability, at least population variability was, maybe not community, I don't know if we looked at that. Um, latitude, we saw that both population and community variability is related to latitude. And then habitat type, um, looking at marine, terrestrial, and freshwater, um, showed clear differences in the amount of population and community variability. All right. So let's talk about future directions. Let's talk about next steps. What are my plans? Because um, I'm new in this space. I feel like the first publication that I had on it was like 2021, was about variability stuff. And so one of the things I want to look at, and that I have a grad student, Clever Tim Catton, who's really interested in looking at, is that looking at population variability for a given species and how it scales across the species geographic range. This stems from some of what we're thinking around abundant center ideas, where we expect population abundance to be greatest in the center of the species geographic range, which there's no evidence for, it's not a thing. But let's assume it's a thing. We'd also assume that if populations are smaller toward the edges of the geographic range, they'd also be more variable as a function of demographic stochasticity. And so we're, we're currently working on that, devising both experiments as well as playing with some, uh, I think he wants to use eBird data, let's see. Uh, another thing I want to be thinking about is a lot of times we take this entire time series of um, population like variability and abundance and we just like compute one statistic on it. And I feel like we get just one estimate when we could look across a rolling window, especially, and this is especially important if your population is stable for some time and then something perturbs it and it starts declining or it just increases or decreases rapidly and, and shows more variability as a function across that moving window. And so I think that's really important to look at. And this is like a sneak peek of some early work that I'm working at on um, ephemeral communities of zooplankton in, um, in ephemeral pools. And so we see like density over time. And these are the ways we can think about how the environment is potentially structuring community synchrony or, or community variability. And so the environment is not just like a monolith. It doesn't just, it's not just, oh, it's a, that's a variable environment. That's a very low information statement. And so it could be variable in its temporal variance. It could be variable in terms of the direction that it's going. It could also be variable in the noise color, in, the, in that sort of lagged autocorrelation and the structure of the environment through time. And so that's what I want to start doing more stuff on. And then finally, um, I want to take all of this, all of these ideas, all of the testable hypotheses that we generate um, from my like kid playing with Plato version of mathematical or theoretical modeling of the Ricker model. And I want to test it. And so I want to look at in simple microcosm or experimental systems, do we see these things? Do more variable environments cause more variable population dynamics? And then lastly, yeah, this one I've been wanting to test since I was a PhD student. And, uh, but yeah, is the structure of environmental variability really important for um, underlying like, disease dynamics or just population variability? And to do that in our lab, we have three different systems, which I'll talk about. Um, I guess I can I can expound on them, but I'll talk about them briefly. We have uh, pigmented yeasts. And so this is all brewer's yeast that is the same species. that's just been genetically modified to express a different pigment. Super cool because you can essentially test neutral community theory from, in this. Right now we're confirming slash maybe not confirming um, that they are neutral. And so we're starting to see that there are some small differences and we think it may be related to the cost of actually having to produce the pigment messes with your demographic rates. And so maybe we don't have a neutral set of species, um, but even if we don't, we can still do some cool experiments with, very excited about that. And it's community level, community on a small, tiny bucket. Um, we also have Daphnia in the lab and they're really great for looking at temporal variability in uh, population dynamics as a function of the environment because they're so sensitive to the environment. And we can really mess with them. We can really put the sort of screws to them in terms of like temperature vari uh, variability or variation. Um, and it's a system like we've worked in before as well. We have some like spatial arrays of Daphnia. So we can basically do Daphnia metapopulation stuff right now, which I'm really excited about. And then finally, a holdover from uh, my postdoc with Alan Hastings, working with him and Brett Melbourne, 
we have flower beetles in the lab. Um, flower beetles, great experimental system. We've used them to look at um, neutrality and dispersal, um, as well as, what else has Lauren done? This is all Lauren Holian's work. She's been great at the beetle system. Um, yeah, we just got a pathogen to infect them. And so I'm really excited about what we can do with host pathogen dynamics. It's a fungal pathogen that grows outside the body and is uh, and transmitted after they're dead. So it's like an environmentally transmitted pathogen. So uh, and that's all I had. I zoomed through that. I apologize. That moment of silence was just like pressing on me. Um, I would like to acknowledge funding sources as well as um, two universities that I've, I've worked at over the past four years as well as you for listening to me. Feel free to email me, uh, tweet at me, check out the GitHub um, or check out the lab website if you have any questions or wanna know more information about what we do as a lab. And thank you. Ted, that was great. Um, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Yeah, my bad. Uh, yeah, we could keep going for a while. Um, Please use a microphone because we do have some workshop participants and other invited scholars online, I believe. Um, so yeah, I guess David back and then Anna. Oh, sure. I did, there's maybe one on each, uh, each row or something. Hello. Oh. <laughs> hey. uh, really interesting results with the latitudinal gradient stuff. Um, maybe I missed this, but was was that trend maybe driven by either the greater effect of like anti-correlations in individual population abundances or just like lower overall fluctuations? And now I'm seeing there's a population scale uh, graph on the top that I didn't see. <laughs> All right, <laughs> never mind. Though. But it could still be driven not by that, but by either variation in species richness or environmental variability. Yeah. And I can't disentangle those. And I'm trying to think of how I would do that. I don't think I even talk about it too much in the paper. But I've got goldfish brain, and I published that two years ago. So it's like, all right, maybe we did. Did you look at spatial uh, variability at all? Would you? Do you mean like? Wait, yeah. So within this data set, I mean, could you also kind of come up with a latitudinal analog, a spatial latitudinal analog? So spatial variability rather than temporal variability. trying to think of how to do that. I think the answer is yes, but I'm trying to think. Yeah, and I'm sure it's it would, really messy data when you first download it, so. Yeah, and there's nothing constraining like the duration and structure of the time series. So even nearby time series could come from periods that don't even overlap. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Right, right. Which is something we could do with the NEON data. Yeah, for sure, cool, thanks. All right, thank you. Thanks, great talk. Uh, I was curious about the community that you mentioned here. What, what is the community really consisting of? Is it the same type of, of species then, or in this data set, I'm not really familiar with the data set. Yeah, that's in the biotime data, you mean, these data? Yeah, in the biotime data. Yeah, so it's, um, I could add an extra slide on that. There are communities that are generally structured by group that this, individual studying. And so you see most of the data come from studies of terrestrial plants. Um, there's one other that I tried to remember, but now it's escaping me. It's mostly terrestrial plant data, to be honest. Um, there are you know, small mammal data in there, but presumably the community data are all like species that occupy the same guild that are not like eating one another. I don't think it's supposed to represent like food web dynamics. I was taking it as like, interacting through competition and not through predation level of community. Um, but I'd actually have to like dive into the data more to make sure that is true, but I think that is true. Okay, thanks. That's fair, yeah. Instead of a, uh, and assemblage is nice, I mean like, it could be non-interactive, right? I say community just being like, yeah, it's, they're all existing in the same place, but not necessarily interacting. So I mean, that's not a good definition of community. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, were the, were, I, I don't know this community disparity measure. I've not come across before, so it's cool to see that. Uh, it, is that somehow, does that scale by 
the number of species in the community and how, how could that affect some of the later results that you showed where you, you don't have that expected uh, in, in the natural systems, you don't have the, the kind of expected portfolio effect. Because um, do you mix in communities of different sizes and, and if you scaled for that, would that help bring back the portfolio effect or not? Sorry, that's a really messy, ugly question. No, no, it's messy, but it's good. Um, because if you were using coefficient of variation, you'd be like relying on that mean standardization to actually get it and, and punch it back down into something comparable. And this, it's PT plus one is population size at time plus, uh, T plus one. P of T is right below it. K is like some standardization constant. So ideally, no matter your community size, or at least like your population sizes, that should converge down to something that is comparable regardless of species richness, right? Unless I'm thinking about it wrong. This is basically the average logged rate of change in abundance. Yeah, so that should that should give you a mean of zero, hopefully. So, um, yeah, I can't think about things that quickly. I'll have to read your paper. If you look into the structure of the of the formula, I oh, know it's in I oh, know it's in absolute value though. Sorry. No, I mean, as I say, you can reduce that down. I was interested. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. Here. But you know, yeah, it's it's in, <laughs> it's in absolute value. So no, that's it, you can. But if if you remove absolute value, you will just reduce it to first and last one. Yeah, I should yeah. realize that too. Yeah, basically. It has bounds. The lower bound would still be zero. Yeah. No. Yeah. Because I have so much. Maybe Owen had something as well. Thanks a lot, Tad. Can't remember. Um, so in the in your Dallas and Kramer. You found that the, the real communities didn't show evidence of uh, what this portfolio effect. So, yeah, I can't remember though. Did you look into why? What was the difference? I mean, presumably it's because they don't show a lot of because it's because the population show a lot of positive, um, a lot of synchrony. This is before I started thinking about synchrony. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I wish. I, yeah. If I knew now what I know then, I would have like attacked this a little bit more and unpacked I, it more. Because I was happy just finding like, oh, weird. There's no portfolio effect. Okay. But there's a latitudinal signal in variability, and I was like, I'm done with that I project. Okay. When I okay. should probably okay. should have stayed around and dug into it a little more. I think it must be right. There's, there'd be zero synchrony. Or there'd be zero correlation in the um, in the simulated data, right? That makes sense. Yeah, there are. There's going to be zero or very low and correlation. Then, there must be a lot of positive in the in the real data. Then I think uh, probably Increase. just shared responses to the environment. I think that's yeah. Yeah, I think so. Just wondered if you had it and I missed it. No, I mean we have the people to do that during this workshop, yeah, right? Yeah, especially with Laura yeah. coming and knowing the data like backwards and forwards. Yeah. Uh, so the, it was maybe a throwaway comment that you made at the end uh, that about the a question you want to look at in the future that um, we expect populations at the edge of a range to fluctuate more yeah. because of demographic stochasticity than those in the centre of the range, which will have a higher population abundance. That seems a little counterintuitive based on something else you said, which is the way we normally um, model what's it called, demographic variability is through a Poisson process where your smaller populations will have a smaller variability, a smaller variance of, of that Poisson random process than larger populations. So I, I just couldn't keep up with what your 
thought process was there? Maybe you can. Yeah. So first part me. is right. The second part, I think I may have misexplained it. Um, think about if you had uh, 10 individuals that were reproducing and you didn't know how many offspring they were going to have. You can pull random draws from a Poisson distribution with like, say, five. That's still going to have way more variability than if you had 100 individuals all pulling from that Poisson distribution. As you start to have more and more individuals pulling from that distribution, it'll just settle upon some mean with small variance. By having that small population size and pulling from Poisson and flipping a coin to determine you live or die, that's going to introduce a lot of demographic stochasticity. Okay, thanks. Okay. That was really great. We will take a five-ish minute break, then there'll be a, a minute of silence. I think we'll come in over the speakers and then when that's finished, we'll get on with our, our next talk. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot.